This week we're getting the wheels mounted up. Welcome to Hack a Week. Well, let's get caught up here. Uh, as you recall in the last video, I just got the wheels roughly mounted up. The rear wheels from a 74 XL250, 18 inch rear wheel. The front one was from a 83 XL200R, that's a 21 inch wheel. Well the, uh, the 200R had a spacing on the forks that was a little bit narrower than what this CB360T triple tree is. Incidentally I've been doing a bit of research and uh, the CB450T has a very similar tree, um, a little bit beefier. and I. I kind of think this one might be a little bent. We'll get into that in a minute. Um, but anyway, because that spacing is a little wider, I needed a longer axle for the front and I needed to make some spacers for it. And on the rear, it's got a different axle that goes on there. And well, I've already done some work, so we're gonna kind of go backwards and then catch up to where we are now, getting this front wheel mounted up. What you're seeing right there is the front sprocket. I painted it white on the face here so you can see it. I've got a wire that's running parallel to the sprocket coming all the way back here to the rear sprocket and I've aligned the rear wheel to that front sprocket so the rear sprocket is right here. You can see when I zoom in again they're lined right up nice and parallel as per my little wire which I painted white you can probably see a bit of that but there's a problem the problem is clearance right there. That's a shock mount bolt and that's definitely going to need some clearance and right now that is totally interfering with the sprocket nuts, the retainer nuts. So uh, I turned over the engine one day a little bit but I realized that you all out there have not actually seen or heard it turn over. The uh, exhaust ports are sealed up with rubber from an inner tube. So it's got a built in Jake brake right now. <laughs> but it turns over. Good news. Got the bars here today. Moose, the Moose bars, Moose racing bars. I bought 28 bucks, 30 bucks, something like that. Shipped. Not bad. Let's get those on the bike. Moose racing. Race ready, man. Race freaking ready. What have we here that arrived in the mail today? It is a box inside a box with papers. Papers, handy stuff. They are 14 and a half inch or 365 millimeter, all black, cheap ass shocks from Dime City freaking cycles. Yep. Never thought I'd buy anything from Dime City cycles, but I did. What the hell? Yeah, these were uh, about 85 bucks for the pair of them. And um, yeah, they're just cheap ass shocks. Nothing fancy about them at all. Um, they're adequate. I'm sure they're definitely not high performance. If you were to get these things out off-roading and bang them up and down a whole bunch of times real fast, the oil would get hot, start to thin up, and they would probably lose a lot of their dampening ability. But here's the deal. These are perfect for me to prototype with on this bike to figure out what I'm gonna do with the shocks. So these are supposed to be 14 and a half. Yep, they are from I to Clevis. 
something I picked up while shopping for these. That's an eye. That is a clevis, and that's what I need. I was on this bike on the swinging arm. It's a clevis mount, and up on the frame, it's an eye. All right, well, let's stick these things on the ass end of the scrambler, and um, I can finally get it off from the engine stand and on the ground and see where it really, where it sits. Okay, let's get some shocks on here. These came with three different bushings. I believe they were eight millimeter, 10 millimeter, and was it 14, 15, 14, 15? I don't know, can't remember. Anyway, putting a little bit of lube on the peg here and a little bit in this bushing because this is supposed to be a 5 8 but right now it's looking like about half inch. Um, that's the difference between like 15 millimeter and, four, and 13. So, I don't know, man. We'll see what happens. See if I can push these bushings and even get them started. I guess so. Yeah, they squish a lot. Alright. Enough to get the washer on, which is what really matters. And Ooh, we're coming out where I'm going to raise the rear end up even a little more, and I've still got adjustability on the preload of the spring. So I've got to take my piece of PVC pipe off on the other side that I had holding everything together. Get that out of the way. And get this up here, line it up. Spin that one in. Get that one a wrench in a minute. That's one side. Definitely going to have some clearance issues over here on this side with uh, the studs that hold the sprocket on. You can already see they're going to bump into the shock. Definitely not going to clear it. Um, I can move the tire forward to take care of that for right now. I'm just going to go ahead and put this on and we'll tighten them down. So I want to remove these six eight millimeter studs and all you need are a couple of nuts. This works for any stud. Two nuts that fit on the stud. Thread one on far enough to get another nut on. Hold the first nut. Get the right size socket. That would help. 13 ohm meter. And hold that first nut. Hold your nut. And then tighten the second one up against it. Now I'll go back to this first nut, the one all the way on the inside. And as you turn it, it's locked up against the other nut on the stud. So I should let you take the stud out. You move it back and forth a few times as you come out to keep the threads cleared out. Because up at the top of each one of the studs, there's a section where there's no threads. And when you tighten it down all the way, it does distort the threads in the hub just a little bit right at the beginning of where they are. Once you get it far enough, you can probably get on it with a socket. I don't know how long these are. I'm not sure how deep they go. Don't know a lot about this assembly. I would assume that between here and there, there are rubber cushions. So what I'm after is to get all these out and then replace these with a bolt that would hold the sprocket on. So oh, that's pretty deep. So I want a pretty good grade bolt to do the job. I would prefer something like this, a button head Allen, because it's got a nice low profile head on it. I might be able to get away with just a regular hex head, but um, I've got this one hanging around, so let's just see. We'll put this all back together without any of the studs and then I got a couple of these I think we can just temporarily put in there, see how they work out for clearance. You know, there's always got to be that one stud that wants to be the bastard and not freaking move. 
that one. And it's the last one, of course. All right, let's try just a little bit of heat. From the map gas, not too much. We got rubber stuff going on inside there. It's gonna warm up the stud a little. Warm up the aluminum a little. Alright, what the hell, let's try um, vice grips. Kind of, not ever crazy about doing this, but they'll bite right into the stud. Get it squeezed good and hard here. And then let's see what happens. Oh, come on, baby, just break loose. Don't break off. Ah, oh, there we go. Yay! Now we can get it with the double nut technique. Hopefully I can still get a nut on there. Because I'm sure I boogered the threads up a little. Yep, I think we're gonna be alright. There we go. Turned into a nice little journey about how to get studs out, even the really stuck ones. Okay. I'm just gonna put two of these in, because um, that's all I got. <laughs> but it'll give me an idea on uh, how well they're gonna work as a replacement. I'll probably put a, I don't know if I'll need a washer with them or not, because this does move like this a bit. So I really should have something to lock it down solid, but let's just see what we've got for clearance like that. Yeah, that's going to work. There's plenty of clearance there now. I got about um, six, six millimeters maybe, six or eight, six. Cool. So there's room for a big old lock washer too. Awesome. All right. Um, let's let it down on the ground. Let's see where it sits. front forks look a little tweaked but I may have them mounted wrong in the trees but I got a feeling that uh, they might have got a little tweaked somewhere in their life whatever you know that's about right for me I can touch the ground okay and this is definitely raised up from stock um, I don't know how many inches but we'll find out in a second when I put the kickstand on one-handed kickstand installation coming up whoa All right, so there's the stock kickstand. If I lean it over onto that, wow, that's, yeah, that's over quite a bit. So normally it would probably be about there. I've raised the bike up probably two inches, two more inches at the bottom, something like that. Possibly a bit more. Sweet! So there it is parked on the side stand, the stock side stand uh, with some blocks of wood. And to me, that looks like probably pretty close to the angle it was when it was at its stock height if you were to park it on the side stand and I've got some blocks of wood here that are holding it up what are they it's like they're about almost two and a half inches so when you look at it that way I've raised the probably raised the frame up from stock height at least two two and a quarter inches so after all these measurements, I've got an idea now of uh, how long of an axle I'm going to need with this setup. So these lugs right here, where the axles go through, those are... So let's see, I've got uh, the width of those two lugs combined, they're 34 each, is 68 millimeters, plus 20 for the thickness of a nut, uh, which equals 80, plus 134. Distance in between the forks equals 224. So I need an axle about 224 millimeters in length. 
Um, I found one on eBay. I think it was like measured 228. Bought it already. Isn't that amazing how I bought it already in between these shots? Yeah, well, anyway, it should be here soon and we'll get the front tire spaced and mounted up and then we can move on. As you can see, this front wheel is offset a little bit to, uh, well, you're right, but it's actually to the left when you're sitting on the bike. So um, the spacing is a little different, as I mentioned earlier. Over on this side, we're right up against uh, the fork boss there, but over on this side, we've got a gap. So not to worry, this axle I bought, uh, picked that up on eBay for less than 20 bucks, came with some spacers. I took the spacers to work to the lathe, did a bit of work making a few different uh, widths. Turns out the 15 millimeter one I made, 15 millimeters wide, fits in there quite nicely. Just snug. So I need to put that one in there. Kind of tough to do one handed, but anyway, that fits right in there. So we're gonna get that on and then we'll get this tightened up and that'll take care of the front wheel. Then we need to uh, adjust the spokes to move the rim in relation to the hub over that way a bit which won't be so bad on this because if you uh, sight down there, if I can get the camera just right here, you see how the hub on this side sticks a little bit out that way? Well, that's the way it was on the uh, original bike. So I need to move the whole rim that way just by loosening the tension on the spokes on this side, tighten them up on this side, that'll move it over. And it'll essentially be in the center of the hub at that point. On the rear wheel, it needs to go uh, the other way you can see right there there's a gap down in here this section here there's a gap of about probably 24 millimeters or so about an inch and then over on this side the gap is probably right there where my finger is that's probably about 13 millimeters or half inch so this needs to move over this way about 13 or 14 millimeters same thing i just do that with the spoke tension okay let's get this shim in here i just need to pull the axle back far enough to be able to drop the shim in come back here So this was the only 15 millimeter diameter axle I could find that would work in here that was long enough, but the threads only go to right there. You can see there are some portions of this that are not tapped with threads. Now if I had a die, I would just thread it, but I don't have a die that big. Maybe at some point I can do that, but what I can do for now is just shim it up with probably this washer and I've got an extra shim I made in anticipation of this yesterday I put that on there and then I can spin the nut on there and get that tightened up and then we'll have the front wheel mounted up it's a self-locking nut that's why it's just now got a little difficult turn okay good enough for now now we can uh, get these spokes retentioned move the rim this way the way to do that I'm gonna go around here loosen all of these like a half a turn and then go over to this side and tension these up a half a turn so I want to keep the wheel like straight like this so I'm gonna take some vice grips and just lock it down here against that that stop point that's on the frame so it doesn't move around on me. So I've got a little itty bitty wrench here. This is a 5.5 millimeter wrench. And I don't have a spoke wrench, but this works fine. It fits the spokes. It's a little bit tricky to get on there. It's a tight fit, but it does fit. My other alternative would be to use my favorite 
proto crescent wrench ever. I love this thing. Got a nice oxidized patina on it, black oxided. Found this somewhere um, in my many travels through things. I think I found it in a car, working on a car or something, an engine bay. I don't know. Nice little crescent though, itty bitty one. I could use that too. It's a little bit easier. I think I used this on the CB750 when I was doing the wheels on that. So we'll start on this side and I'm going to start at the valve stem just as a, a point of reference and uh, what I'm going to do is just loosen every one of these spoke nuts a half a turn. Oops, that's tighten. Lefty loosey, righty tighty, but it's backwards when you're looking at it this way. Um, it's righty loosey. So let's just go a half turn on all of these. And we're back around to the valve stem. Now I go over to this side and we'll tighten these on this side by a half turn. And there we are back at the stem. Let's see. Yeah, it moved a little bit. Looks like maybe one more round of that and I'll be right on the mark. We're pretty close now. I can't seem to find my inside uh, calipers. I think I have them at work um, in the machine shop. But I do have my drafting dividers, which could also serve the purpose if I just put these in here like this and just let them adjust where they want to, like so. And then come over here, check this side. Yeah, we're, we're pretty close. Let's try a different spot in the rim just to see if I'm got any deviations maybe in that spot. I'm setting them wider than the gap and then just pushing it through and then they just kind of set themselves to the gap. Yep, we're pretty close. I could probably go a little more to this side. All right, not too bad. Let's give it a spin. You'll see where it hits in that, that part where it, it got somebody banged into something hard and it's actually deviated down that way. But as far as left, right, that's close enough for now. And I can true it again later once we get the whole thing on the road and I get some miles on it. So the rear wheel has to go that away just about 13 millimeters. So I think what I'm gonna do is just, uh, instead of this half turn at a time stuff, I'm gonna go two turns loose on this side, two turns tightened up on this side. And these look a little bit kind of dried out, slightly more corroded on the, uh, the spoke nuts. So I put a little bit of marble mystery oil on each one, let it soak for a bit. And um, now I'll go ahead and get started doing my thing here. Well, turns out my guess of almost two turns here and two turns there. Actually, it was about one and three quarters loose on this side and about the same tightening on the other side. Let me get my makeshift caliper in here. So there's, there's the right side. And here's the left side. And it's pretty darned even. Good. So now we can just check how true it is. Let's see if I can zoom in a little better for your benefit here. I'm just gonna lay this up against the rim and hold it with my finger and then give the wheel a spin and we'll see what we got. Boy it's pretty darn close. Just one spot where it deviates over to the right just a little Not bad at all. I think I'm just going to leave that alone for now. Now we can get it back on the ground. And uh, let's check where we're at with rake and trail on the front end. Lower this thing back down and get it off from the stand. So let's check the rake angle. That would be the angle of the steering head and the forks. I've got this nifty app that I found on the app store. It's just called Angle Meter. 
and you know it's it's close enough it gives me a basic idea where I'm at it might be off by maybe half a degree something like that but it's close enough and that shows 62 and so if we uh, minus that out from you know 90 is straight up and down and so if we go backwards I'm reading 61 there Sixty-two, so 28, 29 degrees from vertical. Okay, we've established the rake angle, and uh, that is about about 28, 29 degrees from vertical. Now we're going to check the trail. So what we need to do is take this imaginary line through the steering head, right down through the steer tube, if we were to draw an imaginary line and then we're going to mark where it intersects with the floor. So I've got a straight edge here that I can do this with and I'm pretty much just going to eyeball it. There's a weld line here on my steering head which, which helps a bit. And what I'm working off from is this leading edge of my straight edge. So I'm just going to hold this up here and just take a good look at it. Make sure I'm actually right in parallel with everything. And then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to sight down this and put a mark on the tape where that would intersect with the floor. This imaginary line right here with the floor. So I've got a mark there. Let's make that mark a little bolder. Now I'm going to take a plumb bob, which is just basically a weight on the end of a string so that you're getting a true perpendicular to the ground measurement. This one's just a carpenter's plumb bob. It's got a point on the end and a string on it right in the very center. You can buy these at hardware stores. And we're gonna put it right in the middle of the axle bolt and just let it come to a, a rest where it stops swinging around and we'll put a mark there. Okay, so I've got a mark right there. Now we're going to measure that distance. That distance is the rake. The longer the rake, the more stable the bike's going to be. This is about two and a half inches, something like that. So that's actually going to change a bit as uh, the bike goes into dive and stands up a little bit steeper. So roughly two and a quarter inches of trail. Um, that's not too bad. Uh, there's dirt bikes out there now, brand new ones that have two inches of trail. And a few things will affect this. Now I've got room up here to raise everything up on the forks. And what that's gonna do, if I raise it up, that's gonna rake everything back. That'll give me um, a little bit uh, shallower, steeper, shallower, shallower, uh, rake angle if I do that. So roughly two and a quarter inches of uh, trail. Newer dirt bikes run around two inches. Uh, look some of it up. There's a few things that will change that. Right here I've got room to actually move the whole frame in relation to the forks up a good inch. If I do that that's going to uh, that's going to rake everything back. That's going to change my rake angle a little bit. So it'll probably get to where it's maybe 30 degrees instead of 28 or 29, and then that will increase the trail because everything goes like this. So that forward line is going to move a little bit in relation to where the axle perpendicular to the ground is. Another thing that will affect it is the offset on the triple trees, the offset between the forks and the steer tube. If I was to move this back towards the steer tube, you can imagine that the axle would also move back. That would increase the trail, which would make the bike more stable in a straight line, but it would make it harder to turn. So it's all about a compromise in what your intention it's all about a compromise and what your intentions are for usage of the bike. Choppers end up with a lot of trail. They end up with sometimes six inches or more. But that makes them difficult to turn. 
and then they tend to fall off when they go off center at slow speeds it tends to fall off because then everything wants to settle down the geometries get all kinds of goofy so when you're messing around with this you need to stay within some certain parameters and that's good advice for people doing mods to uh, cafe racers and such it's really important that you check rake and trail make sure you end up with something that's not going to be a tank slapper you start getting down to almost no trail and you can get in trouble that's when you're building a tank slapper and you're going to end up in the ditch i think what i'm going to try with this is is raising this up and then make all my measurements again and see what kind of changes that makes okay these are now moved up let's we'll see what that did to the rake angle Yeah, now it's uh, about 30, 30 degrees, yeah, roughly, 61, 62, it didn't change much, so it's more leaning towards 29 or 30. So where did we end up? We ended up at about two and three quarters of trail, whereas before we were at about two and a half, so I gained a quarter of an inch of trail. Uh, what I gained was a little bit more stability and um, also raised the uh, the height of the bike up a bit because now to park it I've actually got to raise the blocks up underneath that kickstand a little bit higher I've got it now on a 4x4 with a piece of plywood underneath it that pretty much makes the bike stand straight up and down so that I can check all this but it definitely raised it up Probably another, another good half inch at the bottom of the frame. Well, there it is. It's raised up quite a bit from stock. And we've got the uh, rake and trail figured out. I got the forks all the way up at their full height. Got the ass end kicked up as high as it'll go. So that takes care of the wheels and the axles. Chain alignment's okay. Probably going to put a seat on that's a little bit lower than this. It's not bad, but um, I don't know. I'll try it like it is. We'll see what happens with the seat later. This tank has got to get in the sandblaster and get this ugly ass paint off from it. That's going to be something that's going to happen before the next video. So, what's next is getting the power plant running. I need to get some carburetors on there and some header pipes and an exhaust. We'll get some points in it few other things. Going to check the top end before we fire it up. Got some stories about that on the CB360T motor. Uh, some issues with the um, rocker arms that they had. But anyway, that's for the next video. So thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing and sharing and for all the donations. Really appreciate that. And until next time. That's 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 a sad thing right there. It's okay.